Hi, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're uh, watching uh, from today. My name is uh, Seth Ducharme. I'm a partner here at Bracewell. Um, I'm in the New York office uh, today. Um, I'm uh, joined by my colleague, uh, Lucy Porter. Lucy, are you with us? I'm here. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thanks. So I, I thought we would uh, start today. I'll just give you a little brief uh, background on me, and then we'll jump right into a conversation um, that's going to cover recent developments in sanctions. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Lucy for data privacy, and she'll talk to you a little bit about her background and expertise in that area. And then we're going to wrap it up with everybody's uh, favorite topic, which is cybersecurity. Um, so uh, just beginning, I guess, on what informs uh, uh, my thinking about uh, sanctions and what we've seen recently, um, I joined Bracewell after about 18 years on and off in the United States government in uh, various positions, um, most recently as uh, serving as a U.S. attorney uh, here in New York, um, sometime in uh, Washington where I had responsibility in the national security and uh, foreign policy uh, areas in the Justice Department, as well as enforcement efforts across DOJ components. Uh, and for a while, I had served as chief of a national security and cybercrime section where we prosecute, investigated and prosecuted sanctions, violations uh, and related uh, crimes, uh, both financial crimes and national security threats. So that's the background that I bring to today's analysis and some of the inferences uh, that we've drawn uh, over the last year um, as the sanctions regime in particular. Um, but really more broadly, the U.S. regulatory and enforcement landscape uh, has materially uh, changed with the new administration. So, look, since Russian sanctions are the hot uh, topic today and front of brain for many folks, I think it makes sense to probably start with recent developments uh, in Russian sanctions and then look how those developments fit into the broader regulatory and enforcement uh, themes that we're seeing actually not only in the United States, but also with our partners uh, in the UK uh, and the EU uh, and around the world. So uh, timely enough in uh, advance of uh, Dubai week in our presentation uh, today, uh, there was an annual conference in uh, Washington DC just about a, a little over a week ago to focus on developments uh, in the sanctions program across US UK uh, and EU regimes. And we had the benefit of hearing from some senior officials uh, in the US government and other governments um, directly, uh, and also listening to some uh, corporate uh, concerns and concerns uh, from the heads of the compliance components in the different corporations and financial institutions, which were trying to navigate um, the current sanctions landscape. Uh, bottom line up front, uh, as you all well know, U.S. sanctions against Russia have evolved very quickly over the last few months, and the speed and power uh, that underlie the U.S. sanctions regime, I think, are the critical elements uh, to be aware of and very different from other types of enforcement or regulatory schemes in the sense that, you know, it takes a long time to pass a federal statute from which civil or criminal liability can arise. It takes very little time uh, to impose a new sanction from which civil and criminal liability also can arise. And that's really because the sanctions regime is rooted in the power of the president and the executive branch to make quick national security and foreign policy decisions, which then become implemented through a regulatory scheme and, and, and have the force of law. So that's unusual as compared to other laws. And what it means is, you know, you can't relax for very long, um, particularly now uh, with a sense of confidence that you've got the whole sanctions regime nailed down. Um, as most of you probably noticed, uh, the Treasury Department of the United States, through its Office of Foreign Asset Controls, or OFAC, was announcing uh, a new Russian sanction, um, it seemed, you know, every week uh, for a while. And if not a sanction, a new interpretation of a sanction through its frequently asked questions page uh, and directives. Uh, interpretation, of course, in any legal endeavor is, is really important. So 
the sanctions were coming out on Russia. Uh, you and others were looking at these and trying to figure out, you know, what's this got to do with me? And for for many folks, that was a new experience. Um, depending on the amount of cross-border uh, business that you do and how much uh, exposure you have to the U.S. regulatory systems or sanctions regimes, maybe that's a big part of how you run your uh, daily operations, and maybe it's a relatively small part. But because the Russian sanctions rose to prominence so quickly, a series of risks attach to those sanctions. The initial strict compliance assessment which may or may not apply, you know, to a party at a particular point in time. And by that, I mean, if you had business interests uh, or continue to have business interests uh, in or with uh, Russia or entities doing business in Russia, then initially some of those sanctions may or may not have affected you. But then as the sanctions rolled out, additional types of risk um, arose. And by that, I mean reputational risk. In other words, those who were quick to comply with Russian sanctions were initially um, identified and separated from those who didn't. And so some corporations immediately had to make a determination that because of the new sanction, they had to stop doing business as usual. But others, you know, perhaps lagging behind because of, there was not an imminent need to adjust compliance. Uh, had to and have to decide whether or not there are reputational and business interests associated with those ongoing relationships. And I'll give you a great example. It's not just the association with, for example, the Russian sanctions program or entities aligned with Russia. It could be performing under a long-term contract where the landscape for performance looks a particular way at the beginning of the contract but becomes less certain one or two years into the performance of the contract. And one has to ask themselves, should the sanctions evolve in a particular way, would I or could I perform under the contract and what would my defenses be to exiting the contract, assuming that I wanted to maintain the reputational uh, risk associated with any kind of commercial activity touching the region. So the analysis on Russian sanctions has to be fast and accurate. Uh, you can be both, but it's hard. So it has to be fast and accurate. That means frequently looking at, for U.S. sanctions, the OFAC announcements that are coming out, looking at OFAC's interpretations, taking new looks at whatever transactions you're engaged in at the moment for immediate risk, and then trying to make predictions uh, with some degree of confidence you know, what tomorrow's sanction is going to be and whether or not that will have an effect on a contemplated transaction or a long-term performance contract or some other potential engagement that a business may be pursuing uh, in connection with a long-term plan. So what does that really mean on sanctions analysis? From my point of view and from what I've seen, you know, the government of the United States and also to some degree the UK and the EU have been acting very quickly because of the national security and foreign policy issues that they're trying to manage, particularly with respect to support for Ukraine and the denial of material uh, of the Russian war machine to fight that war. And then all of the collateral um, sort of supply chain issues and economic issues that flow from that. In the United States, sanctions are primarily designed not only to um, uh, advance foreign policy interests, but also to protect the national security interests of the U.S. economy. And so what we heard at the OFAC conference, or I should say the sanctions conference more broadly, was that the Treasury Department and the White House were trying to coordinate with all the other executive branch agencies and foreign partners so that they would ultimately, you know, leave things better than they found them, uh, which is aspirational of government, I think, and not always the outcome. Um, the governments who are involved in these sanctions regimes are really trying to figure it out as they go. And, you know, we saw some disagreement uh, amongst the group that was assembled there as to what the long-term collateral consequences of the sanctions would be for the Russian economy, for the U.S. economy, for the EU, the U.K., and all of the economies that do cross-border uh, business with those uh, governed entities. So it's a long way of saying this is all a bit unpredictable. Um, I think there's two approaches to it, really, uh, and fundamentally, and I would encourage you to think about it this way. 
uh, you can navigate the sanctions regime. Um, you have to do it quickly and you have to do it accurately, but it can be done. And there are, um, you know, lots of lawyers who are capable of providing that advice. Um, but it's uh, it's challenging, and n no business um, goes into business, in my experience, for the sole purpose of being compliant, right? We want to make money. Uh, we want to sell goods, provide services, um, enrich our shareholders and our employees, have a positive uh, culture of integrity and corporate value, and essentially, you know, create value and wealth. That's what we do. Um, that is typically the main mission of a corporation. When you impose these sanctions regimes and compliance regimes, the company has to think about whether or not it just makes good business sense to operate in a way uh, that is more demanding, frankly, on the way transactions are run. Sophisticated entities with good legal counsel can do that, of course. W what I'm hearing from at least some of the folks at the conference was they're making decisions about where and how to do business, not frankly based on the letter of this of the regulation and the ability to comply. They clearly could comply. They're making decisions uh, based on business and whether or not the additional risks uh, and transaction costs associated with doing business in highly regulated markets or transactions or under uh, evolving regimes, whether that just makes sense for the corporation. So naturally, you know, I would encourage you to um, uh, seek the legal advice uh, and uh, work hard and fast to get it right and navigate those regimes because, you know, that's what we do. But I'm certainly sympathetic uh, to corporations now that are looking at some of these areas and saying, you know, the 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 cost is not worth the benefit. And ultimately, corporations uh, make decisions, risk-based decisions on transactions. So significantly more risk in sanctions now than there was previously. It is manageable risk, but it requires attention and diligence. And I think it's really important to look at these developments in sanctions in the broader context of the themes we've seen emerging from the administration. And I'll bottom line up front it for you right now. Compliance, effective, robust compliance programs must not be siloed within areas of subject matter expertise, including sanctions, uh, foreign trade, anti-money laundering, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, uh, anti-bribery regimes. All of these things, you know, at one time or another, uh, someone develops a subject matter expertise in that area. And when that happens, those disciplines can become a little bit siloed. That's not the way, uh, you know, I would ad advise uh, folks to be thinking about this right now, because that's not the way the U.S. government and other regulators and enforcement entities are thinking about it. And they've made that very clear from the beginning of the administration. The Biden administration uh, began very early on with an anti-corruption memo issued by the White House that was quite broad uh, and made clear that corruption from the point of view of the current administration was a national security issue and anti-corruption efforts were going to be international and aggressive uh, and robust. And that could include anything on the one side from the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act enforcement initiatives to notions of, you know, e ESG in uh, traditionally what's a kind of a shareholder assessment of corporate value, the United States government has taken on essentially as a mantra of enforcement. So very, very broad messaging from the White House early on, and then follow-ups like a steady drumbeat uh, every few months. You had the Deputy Attorney General of the United States in the fall say essentially the grace period for corporations, you know, is over, uh, tougher enforcement. Uh, abandoning old uh, policies which were more favorable and generous to corporations with respect to everything from monitorships to intake assessment. Uh, and, and the Deputy Attorney General essentially saying to prosecutors, hey, we know there's going to be some acquittals in these cases. Don't worry about it. Be bold. Take chances. Go get them. Um, that was a dramatic uh, landscape change. They also put a person as head of enforcement for the U.S. Commerce Department who uh, had a background uh, in criminal justice uh, and criminal enforcement in the DOJ and incentivized that new leader to use the Commerce Department 
which is the uh, investigative arm of the criminal penalties for, among other things, sanctions violations and export controls um, and tech, you know, technological controls on dual use items. Um, and they said, you know, essentially, go get them. You know, we heard commerce from the dais along with the other regulators saying, you know, we're going to be more aggressive. And we had the attorney general of the United States say as recently as just a couple of months ago, uh, at a conference in San Francisco to white collar practitioners, um, we are essentially doubling down on what we said in the fall. We're focusing on individual liability in corporations because we want to uh, communicate that there is one system of justice for all. So, you know, you're not going to get away with a corporation paying a fine and individuals getting off easy. Uh, and this is a priority for the department. And then along the way, they created a whole bunch of task forces to focus on everything from kleptocracy and seizing oligarchs yachts to monitoring cryptocurrencies as red flags for anti-money laundering uh, initiatives. Uh, and they shuffled folks around both in DC and in the field. They created environmental justice teams consistent uh, with ESG enforcement priorities. So the armies have amassed um, on the part of the regulators and the enforcers, at least in the United States, and we're seeing similar signals from the UK and some in the EU. Um, the armies have amassed, the messaging is very clear, the trumpets have blared, uh, the banners have been unfurled, um, and they're issuing a whole bunch of new regulations. So what does that mean? To get back to my bottom line up front, it means that if you have a compliance department and you're trying to meet government expectations, and more importantly, I think, you're trying to do business in the same sound uh, way uh, that you've done previously with integrity and with a sense of creating value and growth with confidence that you're not going to get in trouble or even have a whiff of exposure, uh, reputational, legal, commercial, or otherwise. It really means that your compliance department or the outside counsel that you worked with um, has to be talking across those traditionally siloed areas of subject matter expertise. Your sanctions people have to also be thinking like a AML person, any money laundering, and those folks need to keep fresh on what's happening in, in FCPA, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act efforts. Um, we've got to stay current on cryptocurrencies because some people love them, some people hate them, but apparently they're a red flag for all kinds of nefarious activity if you ask the U.S. government. And that's a demand that places demands, you know, on us collectively, on corporate leadership, on our counterparties, on our compliance departments, on our outside counsel. And it really relies on our ability to understand what the government means when it says things and what to anticipate in terms of government action so that we can operate with confidence. Uh, and, and I think bottom line up front, that just means being a little bit faster right now. Uh, not abandoning, you know, our high standards of accuracy for the sake of speed and making sure that our folks who have responsibility for compliance across different areas are communicating with one another and communicating with leadership and outside counsel so everyone can move forward together and there are no unpleasant surprises. So, you know, that uh, I think wraps it up from my point of view as an overview of development and sanctions. I will tell you, uh, and not to bid against myself as an attorney in this space, but the OFAC website is actually quite good. Um, uh, it's a little bit more accessible, I think, than uh, many of the government websites that are out there. They do make an effort to update frequently asked questions. It's not all that hard to navigate. And so not to talk myself out of a job, but a good starting point for those trying to understand whether or not there's a U.S. sanctions regime that could touch upon a transaction or an endeavor in, in which they are engaged or contemplating being engaged, start with the OFAC page. Uh, better to look at it now before it becomes an existential issue uh, than to do so uh, reactively. Um, so we'll save some time for questions at the end. I'm going to turn it over to Lucy uh, in a moment and just put a marker down that um, uh, in the unlikely event that Lucy runs out of uh, smart things to say, I'll reserve a little bit of time to talk about cybersecurity, which is frankly related to many of the issues uh, that we've raised in the sanctions and regulation discussion. So Lucy, uh, with that, I'm happy to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think there's definitely a theme today because, of course, risk analysis and transactional um, consideration play a pull, play a part in data privacy laws also. Um, you know, of course, fines are part of those laws, although outside of Europe we haven't seen quite the large uh, sums and headlines that we see in Europe. Um, I came to data privacy through a transactional outsourcing process. We were, um, of course, with the coming of the uh, general data protection regulation in the EU, we became concerned that we needed to know more about what was coming down the pipeline with this new law. And so I took it upon myself to understand what it meant for cross-border data transfers, because of course, in an outsourcing environment, you are going to have data all over the world. Um, whether to protect citizens' data, place controls on the data market, or promote trade between their countries, some 90 non-EU countries now have comprehensive data privacy regulations. Many of these laws cover both the consumer and employment context. And while many consider these laws to be onerous, it is clear that the trend is towards more regulation when it comes to personal data. Last year, both the UAE and Saudi Arabia joined those ranks. Of course, the Dubai International Financial Center has had a data protection law on the books since 2007, which was replaced in 2020 to bring it in line with the, with the GDPR. While the DIFC law is in full force and effect, we await the executive regulations in the UAE. We expected those regulations in March, but they have not yet been published. Um, we expect that the regulations will include additional requirements, but most importantly, the law is set to take effect six months after publication. Uh, similarly, in Saudi Arabia, we're expecting additional regulations to be published, and they've already pushed back the effective date of that law um, in acknowledgement that the publications of the regulations have not yet been published. Um, notably, the UAE law, of course, does not apply to the DIFC or the Abu Dhabi global market. So while these laws were clearly influenced by the GDPR, none of them are a carbon copy. Um, they have different treatment of the uh, legal bases, such as consent. They have a different extraterritorial reach, and they have exceptions for types of data that you don't see in the GDPR. However, they do have the same um, obligations or similar obligations on controllers and processors, and they grant certain rights to data subjects. Additionally, each of these laws restrict transfer of personal data outside of the country unless certain protections are in place or the receiving country has adequate data protections. Saudi Arabia's law is the most restrictive in this regard. Restrictions on data transfer and the trend towards data lo localization continues to be a topic of discussion and concern. So data localization is that requirement to store data in country and could be could have far-reaching consequences for multinational organizations. How do you maintain a centralized HR database if you can't store data outside of the country? Um, and taken to the extreme, these laws would eliminate the ability to maintain such a database. Um, I do believe that the promotion of trade with Europe has um, led to the passage of so many laws, although Europe hasn't undertaken to formalize the adequacy process with a lot of these countries, I still believe that that is the reason why we're seeing this trend towards comprehensive data privacy protections. An adequacy decision is an acknowledgement by a country that a second country's laws protect the citizens' data sufficiently. Last year, you know, I guess it was late last summer, the UK's Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sports announced that the DIFC was a priority destination for reaching adequacy in recognition of the partnership between the UK and the DIFC business communities. Previously, I think back in 2019, the DIFC had recognized the adequacy of the UK's data privacy regime. Um, 
Nothing has been announced since then, um, but immediately following that, the ICO, which is the Information Commission in the UK, decide, announced that they were going to revamp both the office and the law. So it is assumed that while that work on their adequacy analysis is ongoing, it's slowed in the face of sort of the overwhelming um, move to revamp the law. It's to be determined whether the UAE would be given the same consideration as the DIFC. It wasn't on the list of the UK priority destinations when that list was published, but at the time the UAE didn't have uh, a comprehensive data privacy law, so it's not clear whether that would change uh, now that they have that law. So what I wanna do with take just a few minutes to do is not walk through the individual provisions in the law. What I'd like to do today is share with you some things that you can do starting as early as tomorrow to begin preparing for these laws. Or if you're in the DIFC, things that you can consider um, to refresh your privacy compliance program. Um, of course, if you do have any questions about any of these laws, you know, feel free to reach out and follow up. The analysis of these laws tends to be very fact specific to the specific type of data that you have or the specific type of situation you're in. Um, and so that's why I think a follow up tends to be better for, for analyzing. So what's the first thing that you should do? Well, you should designate a data protection officer. Um, in the DIFC, you may not necessarily need a data protection officer. In the UAE, you will need one. That is a requirement under the law. But in any event, and sort of speaking to what Seth was saying, I also recommend establishing a multidisciplinary team to support your data protection officer or to support your privacy compliance program. So on your multidisciplinary team, you're gonna wanna include your data protection officer if you have one, someone from HR, someone from IT, um, and either someone from legal or someone from compliance and risk. Now, of course, I'm a lawyer, so I'm going to advocate for legal. However, depending on the size and nature of your organization, I've actually seen this work very well to have someone in compliance carry your privacy practice, or your privacy compliance program. And of course, you can call legal when you have questions. We'll be happy to help out. Um, I also recommend uh, considering someone from your marketing group. Now, especially if you're consumer facing, uh, if you have consumer product facing, or if you do an extensive number of marketing campaigns, uh, I think this is a very important person to include. Marketing uses and accesses large and varied amounts of personal data. And remember, these laws cover personal data in the business to business context. So it's not just consumer personal data, it is that business to business personal data, email addresses, company names, company addresses. Um, and I found that clients that engage with marketing early tend to have better implementations, better designed campaigns, and better understanding of how that personal data is collected and used. So the second thing that I recommend is actually probably the most important. And if you take nothing else away from what I said, it is do this, take this back to your organizations and begin advocating for it immediately. Um, and that is to perform a data inventory. You may have also heard this referred to as a data mapping. Um, that is, it is just what it sounds like. Go out and figure out what data you have, where. Um, it does feed into a requirement under the law. That's a special record of personal data, which essentially is a list of all of the data you have, who has access to it, What's the purpose of processing it? What cross border, um, what cross border sharing of the data are you doing? What processors have access to it? Um, but knowing the data as a result of your data inventory, who, what data do you have? Who has access to it? Where is it stored? Is critically important, not just for a privacy perspective, but I'm sure Seth will uh, support me in from a cybersecurity breach perspective, and maybe even a government enforcement perspective. You don't want to wait until somebody comes knocking at your door asking about your data to have to figure out where it is. Um, but in the data privacy realm, having done that data inventory, 
will help you to develop this privacy compliance program. These having assisted clients to prepare for the GDPR, these this can be a little bit overwhelming where to start. Doing the data inventory can help you figure that out. It can help you identify your structured data, what's in a database, what you know, can you easily see and tell versus unstructured data. What's in email? What's in a file folder in a file room? What's in somebody's office? Um, what is biographical data versus what is business data? It can help bring order and structure. Where are you going to start? What's the low hanging fruit? What's going to be the easiest to bring into compliance versus what's going to be really difficult? Um, there is no one size fits all approach to a data inventory. I've seen clients do it themselves. Um, and there are a number of companies out there that have software solutions to help. Um, we can assist with sort of providing tools, analysis um, to vet those companies. I can't make a recommendation on a specific company. I can tell you that at a recent conference, I saw even Microsoft now has a tool, it's a pay for tool, that will go out and search their Microsoft 365 environment to um, find personal data within their environment. But these have become very technology-based sort of tools to assist. The next thing that I recommend is doing a gap analysis with your processors. Again, under these laws, any sharing of data with a third party must be pursuant to a contract, um, which at a minimum typically must specify the scope, subject, nature of processing, and the type of personal data and categories of data subjects. Are we talking employees, consumers, um, or some other uh, category? We do expect the regulations to specify additional requirements, but of course you can begin identifying and, and categorizing the processor agreements, maybe force ranking which agreements are the most important to get any amendments in place. We can begin drafting those amendments to include the missing provisions um, and then you know, get ready to go once we see those regulations and we need to include any additional information within that amendment. Again, having worked with clients, I can tell you that these things take time. Even though the processors should be expecting them, and even where our amendment may mirror language from the regulation, the processors will push back. And I don't understand why, but they will. Um, and so the sooner we can get on that, you know, in recognition of maybe a six month window, um, the better prepared you'll be to meet that deadline. And the last thing that I recommend is probably one of the hardest for most organizations to manage, and that is updating data retention policies and beginning the process of purging data. Deleting data I know is really hard. Trust me, I have hundreds of pictures on my phone of my dog sleeping in the exact same position, but it's just so cute and I, I might need them one day, right? And I get that in the business world, in our, in our marketing portfolios, there is this feeling that, but we might need that contact information. And working to delete that information can be a very painful exercise and a very painful process. But I believe that data is a critical asset. And as such, when that critical asset has reached its end of life or its end of usefulness, it becomes a liability. And when you can't hold on to data or you can't legally have data, that makes it a liability. Um, and under these laws, there are a set of rules for when you can and can't have data. Under the DIFC law, consent is an ongoing process. You have to, you get consent and then you have to continue to get approval to you know can you continue to get that consent and so um 
working to build a process for purging data from time to time is going to, in the long run, help make this easier to manage. And I know it's difficult. And this is one of the things that we really focus on with clients of how do we get everybody on board with doing this? Um, deleting data is deleting data. It's not just tagging it as, you know, can't use. Um, but it does, again, hopefully Seth will back me up. It It's good high, data hygiene. It has, it supports a good cybersecurity regime. Um, and anecdotally, what I hear from clients is once they do this, their marketing efforts actually are better. They are more fruitful. They have better interactions. They don't believe it when they start out, but what they see on the back end is it actually is a, it ends up being a positive thing. So developing that process and developing that system um, is recommended to start. And then the retention policies, you know, revisit those, make sure that the data is being purged at the end of the retention. Uh, if you have a records manager, work with them. Um, if you don't, you may have to set retention policies for data that previously didn't have a retention policy. Um, 99 years is not appropriate. True story, I had a client call one time and ask, hey, can we set a retention policy of 99 years for all this data? No, I will not be working in 99 years, I promise. So probably shouldn't have my data for that long. Hopefully none of us will be working in 99 years. Um, but, you know, there are resources out there. You can use common sense, work together, look at other data to come up with sort of a what is reasonable. And again, these all speak to, excuse me, requirements under the law not to keep personal data after the purpose for which it's the processing has been exhausted. So these are only a few of the steps that you should take to prepare. I didn't speak to anything about, you know, procedures for responding to privacy rights requests, looking at your technical and organizational measures. Um, but I think these things can be done starting today. And even if you don't, even if you aren't subject to one of these laws, these are things that you can do to really improve your um, data privacy regime and knowing the type of data that you have is just so critically important in these days. And with that, Seth, I'll turn it back to you to share some of cybersecurity principles. Thanks very much, Lucy. And I'll just say now, do not purge those dog pictures. Those, <laughs> those need to be archived, you know, regardless of the rule against perpetuities or whatever your 99 year concern is, I'm not really sure. But, but you know, unfortunately pictures last longer than dogs in my experience and we never want to forget our friends. Um, so look, I'm a little jealous of you. That was great because when you talk about data privacy, uh, the terms are self-descriptive and everyone knows exactly what you're going to be talking about, data privacy. Cyber, which is what I'm going to now talk about for a few minutes, um, has become, you know, such a, a broad and flashy and perhaps over-inclusive term as to have almost no utility uh, in creating expectations, I think, for what people are actually going to talk about. And I think that's really common to a lot of the language in technology, um, for example, remember when the cloud came out and everyone kind of vaguely looked up wondering where in the ether their data was going to be stored. So part of the challenge with cyber and why I'm going to try to leave, you know, begin with as concrete a statement as I can is because it's amorphous. It creates typically some level of anxiety. There's not a whole lot of definition built into it. So that's what we're going to do. We're talking about cyber today in terms of what what is the responsibility of management, frankly, to understand their internal controls and to have knowledge of cyber security risk uh, to include data privacy, uh, knowledge commensurate with their responsibility to make decisions. And, and that's really what it comes down to from, from my point of view. So, uh, and frankly, from, from regulators, I think, uh, point of view and from shareholders and investors. Everyone wants to know that whoever is you know, in charge of the ship, leading the corporation, making the kind of bet the company decisions. And unfortunately, while it's rare that cybersecurity risks pose true existential threats to a corporation, sometimes they do. 
And that's what creates a lot of anxiety. So if you're an investor, an employee, a regulator, a counterparty, and you're looking at a corporation, one question that's going to be on your mind and probably is, is what level of confidence do I have that this corporation is exercising sound cybersecurity practices and that they can manage in real time the buckets of risk that are associated with certain types of cyber events, whether it's a data breach, a ransomware attack, or an insider threat that could relate to intellectual property, uh, the private information of individuals, or some other potential uh, risk. Do we have confidence that management uh, knows what they're doing and that the subject matter experts can communicate efficiently with the decision makers under pressure, under stress in real time during one of these events? Um, Focusing on internal controls just for a moment, which should be a concept, I think, familiar to, to, to most in leadership on this call. Um, the Securities and Exchange Commission, for example, has found internal controls issues in publicly traded companies where essentially leadership didn't understand what was happening in the components of that corporation that had cybersecurity responsibility. So it may not even really be an existential threat to the company that's happening without management. It's just that cyber risk has become important enough uh, to investors uh, and others that if management doesn't understand what's happening in the company, then there's a real concern that there's going to be a misrepresent misrepresentation about the state of the company or there's going to be a failure to exercise good decision making within the chain of command. And coming full circle a little bit, the technical language associated with some types of cybersecurity risks, I think, in my experience, is the barrier to that effective communication early on. You know, you have varying degrees of interest in technology amongst leaders and lawyers, frankly, for that matter. And I am a lawyer, not a computer engineer. So I do what other smart lawyers do when I have a technical issue is I hire an expert <laughs> or I work with a consultant uh, with whom I have a good relationship to help me understand not everything, you know, not everything about how a computer works, but what I need to know to be able to spot legal risk associated with notification laws, regulator expectations, ransomware payments to sanctioned entities, perhaps, that could incur liability under OFAC. So you've got to know enough about the cybersecurity issue to be able to make good decisions with confidence under stress and in a short time frame. The shortest time frame and the most stress uh, uh, that, that we've seen on a repeat basis, and I'm sure it'll come as no surprise to our audience, uh, is uh, ransomware attacks uh, and trying to figure out um, in how much danger and what consequences could flow from a decision to either pay or not pay a ransom, how much time do you have and who are you gonna work with? So as part of a ransomware, for example, scenario, almost every uh, a client or corporation is, is going to want to have uh, real subject matter expertise, either in-house in or through a consultant to be the tip of the spear with dealing with the ransomware attack. Everything from negotiation, possibly paying through cryptocurrencies, knowing the threat actor, being able to make predictions about whether or not exfiltrated information may appear on the dark web at what rate uh, and at what cost, first technologically, and then for business leaders and public communications people or uh, public communications leaders and lawyers to figure out what collateral consequences, you know, could flow from an event like that. And that really is just a long way of saying that, you know, what we talked about, you know, Lucy, you talked about it. I've certainly talked about the need to have almost like a task force model. I mean, that's what the government does, frankly, when it's trying to solve a complicated problem fast where there's a real threat, it creates a task force. Task forces for terrorism, narcotics trafficking, and cyber. And it's because it's hard to find one person or even one small group of people that have all the answers at their disposal fast enough to solve the problem if the tempo of the threat is high. And in cybersecurity, you do as much as you possibly can. Let me, re let me retract that. You do as much as you reasonably can to mitigate risk on the front end. 
just as in compliance, you know, companies don't go into business to be impervious to cyber attack. Um, they go into business uh, to make money, create value, uh, create a brighter future, and, and do good things. Cybersecurity is a necessary part of protecting the valuable things that you hold for yourself and your customers and your counterparties. So, you know, this notion that we're going to do everything possible and become impenetrable, I don't think that's reasonable. And ultimately, the standard under which people are judged is, did you act reasonably? Um, it's not reasonable, unfortunately, now to bury your head in the sand and say, I hope that never happens to me, because the public is on notice that cyber attacks, ransomware attacks, breaches, even insider threats are not exotic. They are commonplace. They are as commonplace as I look out the window here in Midtown Manhattan, as commonplace as a, as a pickpocket in Times Square, which, bad news, that's quite common again. Okay, <laughs> So you can't act surprised if somebody tries to pick your pocket in Times Square. You have to you know, do some due diligence and take some measures to avoid that. But you still come to New York and enjoy yourself and have a good time and take in a show and have dinner. You're not so scared of a pickpocket that you fundamentally change your behavior. You just take those precautions. Cyber is the same way. Technical risk, you've got to have people either internally or as your vendors and consultants who can communicate with you effectively enough to give you confidence that you're mitigating threats, that you're monitoring evolving threats, and that if a decision point comes, for example a level of confidence that information has been exfiltrated or not, that you're going to be able to communicate with the people giving that information to a comfort level where you can make decisions. Who you're gonna to have to inform, what you're gonna to have to do, will you have to pay perhaps a ransomware, and what's that, what's that really gonna mean? So you build the task force, you build the team. If you're a small corporation, maybe that's a team of three. If you're a larger corporation with greater resources, maybe it's a team of 20 or more. But you build the team in advance so that you can spot technical risk, legal risk, business risk, and reputational risk. You communicate in advance, you pressure test it regularly, you educate your employees, you demystify cyber to the extent that you can. Every cybersecurity presentation that I've ever seen pretty much can be summed up with the statement, don't click on links. <laughs> uh, and we find new ways of trying to say that, you know. Um, but a lot of it really does come down to managing human behavior in a positive way, your employees and your counterparties and your vendors and your team. And so that means, you know, this notion that we have in compliance and due diligence of KYC, right? This is like a mantra of anti-money laundering, you know, people for decades, know your customer, know your client, know your counterparty. Fortunately, there's a lot of things you can substitute into the C that seem to work well. In cyber, it's really the same. You know, you have to know yourself uh, as a company, know where your data is, know who your counterparties and vendors are, and how they protect data that's accessible to both of you. Because you might do everything right, but if you leave, you know, your side door open, uh, to your neighbor or partner, uh, you know, then that's a gap in your security. So you have to know the security practices of those with whom you do business. Uh, it's very hard to do this perfectly, so you have to do it reasonably. And that means working with people who not only have subject matter expertise in their area of responsibility, but have the ability to communicate their conclusions and recommendations to others who work in a different field. Um, and now, you know, I was chief of a national security and cybercrime section that we stood up about, well, I guess 10 years ago in the government. And the initial learning curve then when ransomware and cyber attacks were still somewhat exotic was quite high for lawyers uh, and even, frankly, FBI agents and investigators and others who were not part of that world. And then it became a niche and a specialty. And so we tended to delegate a lot to the specialists. But now, you know, as with compliance, we can no longer really afford to all be specialists. We have to be able to communicate so that we can coordinate contemporaneously, both before, during, and after a cyber event, so that our decisions would withstand scrutiny from investors, plaintiffs, perhaps, uh, investigators, regulators, you know, our boards and ourselves that we have confidence that we acted reasonably at each step to protect ourselves from technical risk, legal risk, 
business risk, reputational risk. And unfortunately, a lot of what it comes down to, in my experience, is pain tolerance. You know, because of cybersecurity risks, um, you know, uh, we're going to feel the pain somewhere. And it's almost like, you know, I, I think of it as the pain associated with working out. You know, it, it's painful to go to the gym, um, but it's also painful, you know, to struggle to load, you know, seven suitcases into your car and drag them to the airport through security and, you know, get through life dragging heavy things, which we all do in one form or another. And so you can, you know, you can sweat in training or you can bleed in combat, I think, as the Marines like to say. And cybersecurity, I think that's really applicable. The work you put in ahead of time, uh, it's not going to make the pain go away. When you pressurize scenarios, even for training, it's uncomfortable. But then when the real event happens, and, and you should expect something's going to happen, you want to be able to say to yourself, yeah, we're, we may have not seen this exact thing before, but we're basically ready to deal with this. We know who's in charge of what areas. We know what the kinds of consequences are that can flow from decisions. And, you know, we wish we didn't have to deal with this, you know, but we're ready. And that's the reality of cybersecurity, you know, today from my point of view. So, look, Lucy, I see that, you know, uh, when you put a couple of lawyers in front of microphones, unfortunately, you know, we tend to talk uh, and no one's interrupted us. But we do have, you know, like three minutes left. So I'm not sure if there's any questions out there. Uh, we're happy to take them uh, or otherwise give back three minutes uh, to our audience. It's been a great Pleasure to be part of kicking off uh, Dubai Week. And thank you, Lucy, for your partnership today. Well, thank you. So we'll just give it a few more seconds on the technology if, if any of our moderators or or partners want to want to jump in with any questions. Um, if not, I guess I'll just say that within our uh, areas of expertise, if we raised an issue uh, that's interesting to you and we didn't have time to answer your question today, or uh, we didn't get to the level of detail that you were uh, hoping for or expecting, please feel free uh, to reach out to us, Lucy and I collectively or individually, uh, and we'd be happy to talk to you offline uh, and to follow up on any questions that you may have. Well, I saw a couple of, couple of nice comments come through on the bottom there, which we really appreciate. And uh, now I see with just one minute remaining, it seems like a fair thing to do is to give that back to our audience. So, Lucy, I'm going to uh, sign off. Look forward to seeing you soon. Look forward to seeing all of our partners soon. Wish everyone a great uh, Dubai week. Thanks all.